Our third quantum mechanical system that we're going to examine in some detail is called the rigid rotor model. Now this is going to be a model for how molecules rotate and what kind of rotational spectra uh, they create. So in this video we're going to look at what this model entails and kind of what the, what the variables are that we're going to be looking at over the course of the next couple videos. So in this model system we've got two atoms, each with their own mass, M1 and M2. In this model, I've drawn it such that M2 is greater than M1 by having this larger mass and thus the larger sphere here. And each of these is going to be rotating around some common center of mass. So just like the Earth-Sun system, the Earth doesn't really rotate around the Sun. Both the Earth and the Sun rotate around their common center of mass. It just happens. It just so happens that the Sun is much, much more massive than the Earth, so that center of mass is much closer to the Earth than it is to the Sun. So the Earth rotates a much larger distance around that center of mass than the Sun does. Similarly, the heavier atom is going to be closer to the center of mass, and the lighter atom will be traveling a, a total further distance relative to that center of mass. So these things are going to be rotating around this center of mass with some rotational frequency, new rote, which we have here. They're going to have some distance apart, which would just be the bond length using uh, chemical terminology, some bond length L, and this is going to be fixed. So thus, the rigid in the rigid rotor model is the fact that there is a fixed or rigid bond length as this rotation occurs. So the distance of each of these individual atoms from the center of mass can be called L1 and L2, the names of which I have reversed down here. So let me go ahead and say this is L2 and this is L1. If I don't completely mess that up, well, pretty much did, but that's okay. You see what I mean here. And each of them is going to have some velocity vector which is going to be perpendicular to this L, V1 and V2. Uh, V1 is going to be much larger than V2 because, as we said, the larger mass is further away from the center and has a farther distance to travel. Okay, so in order to solve the Schrodinger equation for this, we're going to need to be able to set up a Hamiltonian. And to set up a Hamiltonian, we're going to need to know what the kinetic and potential energy in this system is. So let's start with kinetic. So the kinetic energy is just going to be 1 half mv squared for each particle in our system. So we have 1 half m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. Okay, so this in this system we said we have this fixed rotational frequency. So let's try to take advantage of that. So the velocity of any uh, given atom is going to be 2 pi times L. That's the total distance of a complete revolution around the center of mass. And then, the, and then times the number of times that occurs in a second. So that is the frequency, new rote. So if the frequency increases, the velocity increases. If the bond length increases at the same frequency, the velocity will increase as well. So the velocity depends on two parameters, what this, what this bond length is going to be and what this fr rotational frequency will be. And we know that <coughs> omega, the angular frequency, is equal to 2 pi times the rotational frequency. So looking at the correspondence between these equations here, we can quickly deduce that V equals omega L, the angular frequency times the length from the center of mass <coughs> for a respective atom that we're looking at. Okay, so this is useful to us. We can now say that kinetic energy T equals 1 half M1 L1 squared omega one omega squared it's going to be the same omega for both of them so that doesn't matter l1 squared because we have v squared so we square that we get omega squared l squared same thing for the second atom one half m2 l2 squared omega squared okay then we can factorize this in a different way we can write this as one half 
omega squared is constant, so we can use omega for both of them. And on the inside here, we get m1 l squared plus m2 l squared. And now this is useful because this quantity m1 l squared plus m1 2 l squared, well, l1 and l2 squared. This is the moment of inertia, I. So the moment of inertia is sort of the rotational equivalent for mass in, in angular motion rather than in linear motion. So in linear motion, the resistance to acceleration is mass, and in angular motion, the resistance to acceleration is this moment of inertia. And this moment of inertia is just the mass of every particle times its distance away from the, from the rotational center squared. So that gives us kind of an effective mass for this total system here. So now we can rewrite kinetic energy T as 1 half I omega squared. But then let's also recall from our studies of angular motion that we have the quantity angular momentum L equals the moment of inertia times angular frequency. So this L is the angular momentum, which is going to be a very important quantity when we're studying the rigid rotor system. It's going to come up a lot in terms of expectation values and eigenvalues and those sorts of things. So we'll keep an eye on that. So by this equation here, we can see that we can rewrite T in the following way that we could rewrite it as 1 half i omega squared over i, which would be the same as here, or that is also equivalent to saying t, why does this keep going to red? Let's go to purple. We can say that's equivalent to t equaling l squared, angular momentum squared, over 2 times the moment of inertia. And that's analogous to the, quo to the quantity for uh, linear motion where we have uh, kinetic energy equals momentum squared over two times mass. Here we have kinetic energy equals angular momentum squared over two times moment of inertia. Okay, so this is our final result for what our kinetic energy is going to be. So in terms of our Hamiltonian, we're going to have to find a way to express the kinetic energy operator in this type of way. And then for potential energy, that's going to be very simple. The potential energy is just going to be zero. So when we look at the Schrodinger equation, our kinetic energy is expressed in terms of this type of quantity. Our potential energy is zero. And then the important other thing that we're going to look at is how do we express the coordinate system for what the possible uh, spatial values are as this molecule rotates through space. And what we're going to see is it's convenient to use spherical polar coordinates for that. So next we'll discuss spherical polar coordinates and then see how we can express our operators and the Schrodinger equation and its solution in terms of spherical polar coordinates.